Hello friends, welcome to God's Eagle Ministries at Otakada.org. We are seeding the nation with God's word and God is transforming lives through the timeless truth in his word. Uh, today, we bring you 10.2021 Christmas message by Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, a nation still in search of truth and vindication. Merry Christmas and a successful, a successful Boxing Day and a prosperous New Year, friends. We present 10 points 2021 Christmas message by Bishop Matthew Hassan Koka, a nation still in search of truth and vindication. Oh, by the way, by the mercies of God, I urge you to box no one on today's Boxing Day. Please, please, and please. Where on earth did Boxing Day originate from, by the way? Though it originated as a holiday to give gifts to the poor, today Boxing Day is primarily known as a shopping holiday. It originated in the United Kingdom and is celebrated in a number of countries that previously formed part of the British Empire. It was traditionally a day off for servants and a day when they would receive special presents from their masters. The present, the presents traditionally given to the poor and servants was called a Christmas box, hence the name Boxing Day. So before we go into uh, the 10 point Christian message, let us just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the privilege to share in your word. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Boxing Day and thank you for the new year. Thank you for how far you've led us from our mother's womb. Before we're conceived in our mother's womb, you knew us. Every detail of our lives were written before you, as we have read in uh, Psalms 139. And so today, as we go into this reflection, we ask that it would not just be, we not just be hearers, but also doers, where we can deploy them, the truth that we learn in our daily living, in Jesus' name. Now, uh, amen. Now, reflecting on a message that fits the occasion of the birthday of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, built on nothing else but truth. It is imperative to seek and listen to guardians of truth in our society today who speak rootless and unbiased truth to the battlefield of life so that we can deploy these nuggets of Christian truth that is bound to set us free in the battlefront of life. Hence the presentation of our message today titled 10 Point 2021 Christmas Message by Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, a nation still in search of truth and vindication. Bishop Matthew speaks truth to authority authority and people everywhere without fear or favor in, in, in a world where Christians are cowarding into secular humanistic doctrine at the expense of Christian truth. Now, let's take the first one, uh, the first point of the 2021 message. God, good news to the world, good news to the world. Hello everyone, men and women of goodwill all over the world we to whom the news of the birth of jesus was first announced on that cold winter night where the shepherd kept watch that night when the first noel was pronounced the choice of poor shepherds living in such open dangerous and harsh conditions as the first hearers of this good news must be seen as evidence that the birth of jesus is a guarantee for the healing of our broken world his choice of time place and circumstances of entry into the world remain in sharp contrast to his kingship, his glory and power. Let us open our doors to receive him. Number two, Jesus is a king and the truth. Questioned by Pilate about his claims of kingship, Jesus said, yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth and all who are on the side of truth. Listen to my voice. That's John chapter 18 verse 37. These words of Jesus have a deep sense of finality that force a life-changing decision upon us, depending on the choice we make. When we are confronted with the message of Jesus, we can either abandon everything, follow him as Peter and his brothers did in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 11, I think they're about, come down from our tall trees of pride as the cows did in Luke chapter 19, verse 5, leave our accounting desk as Matthew did in Matthew uh, 9 verse 9 or jump into the water even though we cannot swim as Peter did in John 21 7. 
We can even get up from a sick bed and attend to him, as Peter's mother-in-law did in Luke chapter 4, verse 38, or feel so upset by it all that we call the message intolerable language and simply abandon him in John 6:16. 6, uh, we can face uh, we can we can face with the truth go into murderous rage like Herod and order the killing of all children for the fear that your kingdom is under threat in Matthew uh, 2 16 or like Herodias ask for the head of a carrier of truth like John the Baptist on a plate in Mark chapter 6 verse 25 26 yeah 25 the authorities will take the extreme option of ordering his crucifixion Times have not changed. Everywhere and every time that people holding power without authority hear the sound of truth, they quiver and waver. For the believer in the message of Jesus Christ, truth has a price, including loss of life. Sinful thought, we are led by Jesus. We are also called to bear witness to the truth. Truth is never convenient. Today, truth is often caricatured to mean what the powerful want it to be. Truth is bent to suit the ideology of the party in power, the interests of the economic and bureaucratic class, those who presume they have power over life and death, masters of the universe. Often the windmills of the powerful melt the sweet tears, sufferings of the poor to feed the machinery of state. Secular state power imprisons the truth of Jesus liberates. Hence, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, in John 8, 32. This freedom gives us the spirit to make the right moral choices. St. Paul warned us against the temptation of being tossed to and fro, being carried away by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4, uh, 14. Paul Emeritus Benedict uh, uh, 7 or 9 warned against the dictatorship of relativism, Number three, the third point uh, out of the the third point out of the twenty uh, ten points that we're addressing today. What is Jesus saying to the world today? Today, the persecution of Christians who stand for the truth of Jesus is a worldwide phenomenon. His crucifixion was a redefining moment for the history of humanity because the curtains of the temple split into two. The earth shook, the rocks split, and grace broke open. Matthew. 2751. The message of Jesus remains incomprehensible and unfathomable. His truth has split history into two and our future is determined by side we stand on. As long as evil still stalks the world, as long as people show that they prefer darkness to life, light, so long must the light of Jesus remain a threat to darkness. John 3.19 When Michael Nadi a teenage seminarian from Sokoto Diocese stared down the nozzle of the guns of terrorists and called them to repentance. He knew he was signing his signature with the blood of martyrdom. When Mrs. Bolanley Ataga, a Kaduna Bay's housewife of a medical doctor, defined the evil hands of the head of her captors who sought to violate her honor in the exchange for freedom, she knew she was signing her signature with the blood of martyrdom. When Lawan Andimi, leader of the Christian community in Michika, Adamawa State, stretched out his neck and was slaughtered by his abductors, because of his faith, he knew that his blood will flow into the ocean of those martyrs who have gone before him. When our dear Leah Sharibu raised her voice against the advice of her young Muslim friends who loved her dearly and wanted her to deny being a Christian, she like Jesus acted in her defiance, but she knew what awaits her in a new Jerusalem, the capital of martyrdom. Their heroic witness re-echoes the defiance of the apostles who said, We must obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 5 verse 29. And number 4 of the 10 point, uh, prophetic, prophetic anger and urgency of now. The coming of Jesus Christ into the world marked the end of prophecy because it was about his coming that the prophets of old spoke, Hebrew 1.1. This is why his coming fitted perfectly into the template of earlier prophecy. He was born in Bethlehem, came from the tribe of Judah, descended from Abraham, and was born of a virgin, as all the prophets had foretold. So Jesus is not a prophet. It is to him 
and his coming that the prophets were anointed. As in the days of old, those in power and those seeking power are constantly in search of made-to-measure prophets and prophecies. This is not new. The prophet Micah warned that my people are deceived by prophets who promise peace to those who pay them. Micah 3 5. Prophecy must rise beyond the fraught of the political exigencies of the moment and offer society the lucidity and purity of their message of Jesus Christ. The Lord himself warned that those who kill us will believe they are doing the will of God, that we should expect expulsions from the places of honor. John 16 2. Still, the Apostle Paul already warned, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9 16. He also added that we must preach this gospel not based on convenience or praise, but welcome or unwelcome. 2 Timothy 4 2. We who are bearers of the light of Christ must be the first to admit in all humility that we are saved by grace and faith, not our works. Ephesians 2 8 9. Furthermore, that we carry these sacred messages in weak human earthenware vessels. 2 Corinthians 4 7. We precious must learn the art of humility from the Lord Himself. He was God, yet He learned to obey through suffering. In Hebrews 5 8. We must learn to take occasional rejection as part of our mission. We are often not necessarily better off than those we condemn. There is a lot in our personal and public lives that does not honor the gospel. The very idea that today we are measuring the efficacy of our postulates by the size of human structure or the level of our material prosperity is in sharp contrast to the mind of Christ, the one who was born in a manger in Luke chapter 2, 7. Rode on a borrowed donkey, Matthew 21, 1, and nowhere to lay his head in Luke 9, 58, ate the last supper with his disciples in a friend's upper room in Matthew 26, 18, and was buried in, borrowed, in a borrowed tomb in Luke 23, 55. We have heard complaints from politicians whom religious leaders love to castigate that even they cannot tell the difference between real preachers and merchants simply using the gospel for self-enrichment. The celebration of Christmas calls us not just to condemn injustice in our society, but to act justly, love tenderly, and walk humbly with God. Micah 6, 8. A call number five, a call for environmental justice. For two weeks, October 31st to November 13, 2021, world leaders met in Glasgow for the Climate Change Conference, COP26. While the rest of the world struggles to prepare the future for its civilizations and citizens with a sense of urgency, Nigerians have continued to ignore the existential threats posed by the environmental disaster that we face. Nigeria established an ecological fund way back in 1981 while the Obasanjo administration set up the Ministry for Environment, Environment in 1999. We have heard of plans, projects, huge budgets to resolve the threat to our environment, air and water pollution, waste management, deforestation, desertification, erosion and flood, continue to threaten agriculture, aquaculture and the welfare of citizens despite all these grand plans. Over time, we have seen long good promises caught in the web of bureaucratic fraud. In its encyclical on the care of the earth, Laudato C. published on May 24, 2015, Pope Francis warned that we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the, ex ex to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. There is an urgent need to reverse the effect of our sins against the Niger Delta and to quickly embark on local and national initiatives to ensure the future by full environmental restoration. We cannot afford to continue with the reckless pollution of our environment that is destroying aquatic terrestrial and human lives. The clock is ticking. Number 6 of 10, still on our children. Although we seem to have moved on, ignoring the fate of our children in the custody of evil men, 
this moral scar of shame on our face cannot be washed away. Tales and promises about planned rescues have since deteriorated into mere whispers. Nothing expresses the powerlessness of the families like the silence of states at the federal level. Today, after over seven years, our over 100 Chiba girls are still marooned in the ocean of uncertainty. Over three years after Leah Sharibu is still unaccounted for, students of Federal Government College, <coughs> sorry there, Yauri and children from Ishamia School, Katsina, are still in captivity. This does not in include hundreds of other children whose captives were less dramatic. We also have lost count of hundreds of individuals and families who have been kidnapped and live below the radar, radar of publicity. We have before us a government totally oblivious to the cherished values of the sacred, sacredness of life. The silence of the federal government only feeds the ugly beasts of complicity in the deeds of these evil people who have suspended the future of entire generations of our children. Every day we hear of failure of intelligence, yet those experts who provide intelligence claim that they have always done their duty diligently and efficiently. Does the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria not believe that he owes parents and citizens answers as to where our children are and when they are coming home? Does the President of Nigeria not owe us an explanation and answers as to when the abduction? kidnappings, brutal, senseless, and endless massacres of our citizens will end. When will our refugees from Cameroon, Chad, or Niger return home? We need to all urgent, we need urgent answers to these questions. While I commend the efforts of our security men and women, I call on the President, in collaboration with the governors who are doing their best to preserve and protect their people to develop a more honest, open, robust strategy for ending the humili humiliation of our people and restoring social order to our people. We have borne enough humiliation as communities and as a country. Number seven of ten, an electoral law, the vote and the hope. Happily, we are inching closer and closer in our search for a viable and credible electoral process. We commend the in in Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and the National Assembly for failing, falling into line with the wishes of our people and injecting technological innovation into our <coughs> electoral processes. Sorry there. The National Assembly should quickly take notice of the observations made by the President on the issues of direct or indirect primaries and return the bill to the President for assent. I believe that the President's heart is still in the heart right, right place. I wish to focus on the serious on the serious issues. Emboldened and inspired by these new developments in electoral laws, I wish to call on Nigerians, especially the youth, to seize the moment by coming out to register and be ready to vote. Answers, protests, and the aftermath should be a mere punctuation mark in the sentences and chapters of our struggle for a better society. There's a lot to live for in this country. There's a lot for our youth to dream about. The spirit of Christmas should be seen as a spirit of renewal. Be courageous because we shall turn the corner together. Number 8 of 10, a dialogue of real and true brotherhood and sisterhood. At, at about this time last year, when I raised the alarm about the perilous state of the affairs in the northern Nigeria, all kinds of accusations were leveled against me, especially by my northern brethren. When the Catholic bishop protested openly against the killings of our people in March 2020, we were accused of acting against government with a religious motive being imputed to our noble intentions. Now we are fully in the grip of evil. Today, a feeling of vindication only saddens me as I have watched the North break into a cacophony of quarrelsome blame games over our tragic situation. A catalogue of the unprecedented cruelty has been unleashed on innocent citizens across the northern states. In their sleep, on their farmlands, in their markets, or even in the highway, innocent citizens have been mowed down, turned into bond offerings to gods of evil. Communities have been turned into gulags of mystery, death, pain, perfidy. We must move quickly before Arewa, our beloved Arewa, descends into Arewanism. Number 9 of 10, 
bridges instead of walls. I saw a quote somewhere which said, we were all humans until race disconnected us, religion separated us, politics divided us, and wealth classified us. True, while the politicians have used race, politics, and wealth to divide us, we religious leaders must stand firm in the face of injustice. When the politicians embark on outright favoritism or nepotism, we must not be carried away by the belief that our religion is being favored. The challenge before us religious leaders now is to rescue religion from the clutches of those who are simply keen to use it to feed their ambitions for power. Religious leaders must stand together and condemn lack of fairness to any group because the powerful and the powerless all need to be saved. If we are to learn any lesson today from the tragedy we are in, it is the consequence of the mismanagement of our identities. In this letter, St. Jim tells us that pure and undefiled religion simply means coming to the aid of the poor, widows, and orphans in their suffering and keeping oneself from being corrupted by the world. James 1.27 We religious leaders must encourage our people to return to the values of kindness, love, honesty, trust, and civility into our private, family, and public life. This is the obligation of all those, all those who have heard the message of Christmas and its appeal to us to become men and women of goodwill. The greatest lesson from our collective tragedy in Nigeria is for us to move away from thinking that we can triumph as members of one faith, a clan or a tribe. A good society has to build bridges instead of walls, use differences to build a beautiful coat of unity like that of Joseph in Genesis 37 3. This is why Jesus taught us to pray to our father and not my father in Luke 11 2. Pope Francis in his recent essay clinical fratelli tutti we are all brothers in October 3rd 2020 of the consequences of erecting walls by warning that when new walls are erected for self-preservation the outside world ceases to exist and leaves only my world to the point that others no longer considered human beings possessed of an inalienable dignity become only them. We encounter the temptation to build a culture of walls, to raise walls, walls on the heart, walls on the land, in order to prevent this encounter with our cultures, with other people. Those who raise the walls will end up as slaves within the very walls they have built. They are left with our horizons for they lack the will to change others. We need to take both words seriously. Number 10 of 10. Some good news for us. Finally, some good news for our diocese. We elevated five, de five deacons to the sacred priesthood on September 23rd this year. By the grace of God on December 30th, five days from now, three of our sons will be elevated to the order of the diaconate. diaconate. Please continue to pray for the Lord's blessings upon us. We must never forget the good tidings of Christmas, which assure us that the Savior has been born to us, God's gift to humanity. Luke 2 11. May God give our nation peace. Happy Christmas to all, to us all. And that marks uh, the message by Bishop uh, Matthew Hassan Koka to um, the world. Um, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord cause his countenance to shine brightly upon us. And give us peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. May we walk into this week assured that the presence, the protection, the preservation, the provision of the Lord rests and abides with us always into all eternity. In Jesus' name, happy Christmas and Boxing Day from God's Eagle Ministries. This is Ambassador Monday Orelgio Ogbe, Otakada.org, host over 2 million Christian centric content. That will disciple and equip you to disciple others for Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his countenance to shine upon you brightly and give you peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Shalom.